Hello and welcome to Dialect. I'm Tony Gosling. Dialect's Bristol's first podcast set up in 2002 with a Millennium Grant from the Scarman Trust. We're on Bristol Community FM 93.2 every Tuesday at noon. At least we're supposed to be, haven't been for the last seven weeks due to technical issues. That's bcfmradio.com. This week, Tim Herford, the lead singer of Bristol band The Transpersonals. And we're discussing his new album, Illuminated by the Light of Dreams. Also, Andrew Tweedy, he's an expert on desalination. He's been over to the South Pacific looking at how to do that, a West Country inventor. Also, the dangers of organophosphates. That is apparently the type of nerve agent that was... Novichok was one of these that in Salisbury, which was involved in this poisoning scandal. Also, Peter Oates. We hear about the Hampstead case and why it's landed. One of our regular correspondents, who runs the Victims Unite website, Sabine McNeil, in jail. Dialects produced by volunteers. We're online at dialectradio, one word, dot co, dot uk. We're based at the People's Republic of Stokes Croft on Jamaica Street, and I'll give you our contact details at the end of the show. Right, well, I'm joined by uh, Tim Herford. He's a musician, lead singer for the band The Transpersonals, based here in Bristol. One of the things I love about The Transpersonals, Tim, is that you don't uh, have a desperate need to get massive audiences, that the music is still actually the main thing, and you just kind of concentrate on that. And obviously, if people want to spread the music and they want to buy it and they want to tell their friends, they will do. Which is really good because we don't have a massive audience, so it's, it's good that we, we have that. That, that not caring less about it. <laughs> but yeah no it's 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 uh you know a, a, a homegrown thing we, we none of us are doing it for um the money or the fame um which it, once again is also really really lucky okay so we're going to hear a little bit of that to start with uh first track is at the picnic can you tell us a little bit about Ooh. the song before we hear it are we allowed to? sure sure at the picnic is actually dedicated to a friend of mine he was actually in the transpersonals as a kind of floating member um, not that he used to float around or anything like that, but he might be floating around now in the afterlife because he was found, unfortunately, at the bottom of the Avon Gorge, having committed suicide, in inverted commas. There's a lot of weird things going on in this, in this city, so this is dedicated to Matt Ferguson, okay, former before, member of the Transport. Before we hear the, um, the actual song, tell us a bit about Matt. So, I mean... OK, well, Matt, Matt was just somebody that I met when I was... Years ago, in 2005, I was um, really trying to uh, go into sort out my addiction problems with alcohol. So I would spend a lot of times sat outside of a cafe in Clifton having a latte um, and taking time out to, 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 you know, recover and to learn about myself and whatnot. And that's how I met this guy. He was sat there having a coffee and then we, 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 he was very, very, very eccentric. Um, he always dressed like a mod and in the old days he was known by all the Bristol crowd I think he was called the Prince he used to go down the Tube remember the club the Tube yeah. which is down you know, I don't know what it is now but you know there was like espionage and then <clears throat> there was the, the Purple Heart Club there were all these things that was on the Feckle and stuff like that and, um, which then turned into John the Mod um, Gimme Shelter Club Night which is where the transpersonals were a house band and stuff so we, we were very part, much part of this Bristol scene from a teenager onwards um, but I didn't meet him until this point, and he used to, he used to be like a kind of, I don't know, like a kind of Mark Boland figure back in the day, dancing and all that kind of stuff. But I, I got to know him um, because he was highly eccentric, very, very dark sense of humour. He was very much like Peter Cook. I made a couple of sort of spoof films, you know, conspiracy theory sort of doc, mock documentaries with him just to put on YouTube. Um, and then, you know, he was very hard to get hold of. And, and, you know, I used to go around his house, he used to go around with my girlfriend, and we used to have a cup of tea, and he would sort of entertain us with, you know, it was just... And then, um, unfortunately, he was... Uh, it seems that he uh, committed suicide, and apparently the story is is that he was having a picnic with his girlfriend. Um, and then I think I heard someone say he just jumped up and said, watch this, and jumped off the cliff. I'm trying to actually find out really what happened to this guy. Um, but... Uh, Maybe I'm just paranoid. Take me in your arms and baby love me Make me feel like I'm floating on the moon Doing jumping jacks high as a balloon 
Okay, that was At the Picnic from the new album uh, by the Transpersonals about Matt Ferguson. Um, do, you, do you think, is it possible to do someone like him justice in a song? I suppose it's, it's always going to be... A bit yes, because he had a fantastic, like I say, the, the, what I loved about him more than anything else was his sense of humour. You know, he was very, very witty. Um, he said to me once, we were, we, I went on holiday with Italy, to Italy with him and my at the time acting manager because I was acting at that point and she she got me this advert and I got some money I said let's all go to Italy because he his parents or his mother had bought this true what's called a trulo over there which is which which turned out to be a stone building with no electricity or water in the middle of nowhere in the middle of a load of olive trees it was a bit like with Nail and I it's like you know it really was we've come on a holiday by mistake I ended up having having an affair with well an affair but I ended up getting together with my agent and that turned into a whole drama and it rained there was a plague of flies honestly it was like it was like uh, Moses in Egypt right and in the middle of all of this he looked at me and said this will come to an end it is a nightmare and it it will be a nightmare but it will come to an end. And he said that when we were stuck at the airport. We were so keen to get home. We were having such a miserable time. We arrived at the airport one day early by mistake. Everything was a mistake. That's what was funny about this guy, was he said the universe is a farce. And, you know, it was... It, it, I... Anyway, he's, he's not with us anymore. But, you know, that's the kind of... I don't know what your main question was there, but I just went off on a kind of... Well, it's about about the song, I suppose. If you can do justice to someone with a song, oh, at, that least was you've, at least you've had a go. The justice, sorry, the justice is, is that that song is kind of, like, kind of funny in a way. You know, I've written it like an old kind of 1950s crooner. I think it's a fitting tribute to somebody that had a very cynical view of life. OK, the album is called Illuminated by the Light of Dreams. Yes. Um, are you a big dreamer? You look. You sit yeah. down there when you wake up and think, "Crikey, what was that about?" And Absolutely. write your dreams down. That sort of thing. Of Talk course. about them a lot. I did. I used to do that a lot when I was really struggling to seek and you know have a what I would call a, a naive psychedelic magic mushroom DMT silly experience. Do you know what I mean? I mean, I I mean isn't it possible that dreams are just completely random nonsense? Well, you, 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 you're not, kind of banging your head against a brick wall by trying to make sense of them, no? Well, recently in December, I was in Italy and I was literally banging my head against a brick wall. But that wasn't about oh, dreams. Right. That was about reality and arguing about the shape of the earth with, these, with a flat earther. And um, I mean, the flat earthers are surely there just to... I mean, basically, it's chaff. But, the idea is to just completely you know, try and get people engaged in nonsense. It's a bit like the chemtrail argument where you can't actually make any, uh, dis, you know, this is these trails above our heads, which, of course, are just generated by aircraft, ice crystals form after the aircraft, and you can't go up there and physically examine these things to find out what they are and what's in them. And so it's a perfect way of, I suppose, uh, capturing people's minds up with something that they are never going to be able to get to the bottom of. Yeah, in the words of the the hip-hop rap outfit Ugly Duckling keep the humans entertained and in the end they will be ours Is that what's going on? I think so I think so I think we're uh, engaged in uh, psychological warfare always have been and it's way beyond um, any uh, current context of any era it's an ongoing ubiquitous it's a perennial battle between good and evil or lying and truth. And, and I mean, one thing's for certain is that we're not getting a very good quality from our mass media anymore. Most, I mean, I'm, I sit and look at either whether it's Sky or Freeview or whatever, the stuff which is all this amazing technology to give us all these channels, and there doesn't really seem to be anything on there which is innovating, that is to say is really animating people, is educating people or, or really even entertaining anymore it's all very infantile trivial dumbed down nonsense and that doesn't suggest to me that we've got a, a any anyone who's really serious about trying to do anything to improve our yeah na uh, how our culture national mm. culture education uh, I mean, the purpose of this surely is just to I suppose get people disengaged go off and do your own thing um, but and I, I'm, I'm sort of feel like I'm talking to myself here a bit because I'm coming on to talk about social media, mm. which is one way you can actually get engaged with things that your friends are interested in, and you can bypass, go round completely round the BBC or anyone else that you don't feel is uh, telling you anything of much real relevance, and you go direct to your mates. Mm. 
but but who are your mates? That's the thing. I mean, you might make a bunch of mates that are. I mean, my dad says, who's um, you know uh, still has a television. Um, he, he hates the commercials, hates the adverts, right? Hates the adverts. And I say, Dad, you know, it's all adverts. The programs are adverts for how you're supposed to think and behave. And right, and and, and it's a it's a narrative to how you how you're the story you're being told is 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 a narrative. So you've got adverts that make you buy things. You've got adverts that make you th see things or think things. And the so, problem is you've got advertisers and the the big networks now are just constantly chatting to the advertisers saying, well, what kind of programs would you like uh, to put in between your adverts? Mm. Uh, yeah, it's, it's all adverts. And the right? advertisers say, well, we want this kind of program, this kind of program, sort of trivial nonsense, jolly. Yeah. And certainly, I mean, there's every now I remember over the years, Every now and again, you get a program where you feel like something like Death on the Rock, which I think was Thames Television ITV. So there was mm. adverts halfway through that, a documentary about the SAS murdering these IRA people, executing them, mm. uh, even though they didn't have a bomb uh, and they had their hands up. And imagine the adverts halfway through that. You know, that's yeah, know. not advertiser friendly. And this is exactly what YouTube is doing now. It's saying for yeah. much of the content, which is the most interesting content out there, it's not advertiser friendly. So we're the, demonetizing. The recent, and, recent... and finally, what I'm coming yeah, to yeah. say here is that you've got uh, somebody turning up at YouTube headquarters with a gun and shooting people exactly. a few weeks ago saying, you've, you've, uh, you've destroyed my life because yeah. I was making money through animal rights films and people were watching thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of these films, of views of these films, and you've just taken my income away. Yeah, not only that, but, you know, I mean, we're, if we go from the TV to, to, to the internet, right, recently there was a, a woman, woman that was murdered in, in, in Ireland, for example, and she was, she was put into a wardrobe, right? And then, and then, and then on the front page of the Irish papers, th there was an advert, for, ad, advert commercial for wardrobes right next to the story, right? Okay. And you think, are they taking the piss? But if you go on the internet, right, if you're watching the TV and you're watching this drama dramatised, glamorised uh, CBS reality show about serial killers, that people mimic each other and the people that put these programmes out at the top know that, that human beings mimic other human beings. They want to create... They want to get... For depopulation, they're going to get us to kill each other, right? Or to drive us insane. I remember insane. Basil Valentine from 21st Century Wire saying that actually it's BBC death. You get mm. so much about death on the BBC. Well, on the internet, there's it, no... It's almost a sort of prof self-fulfilling prophecy by the BBC, is that they want there to be more death out there. Television is, ter is national, it has censorship, the internet is global and it has no censorship. And, if, and, if, and it's the perfect tool for Satan to drive everyone insane. Well, uh, all I'll say is that the BBC World Service is marginally better than Radio 4 um, and the domestic services, because they've got to be, because the whole world is listening to them. Anyway, uh, thanks, Tim, and we'll finish with... Do you want to say something about Hold On? Basically, guys, this is a song, everything we've been talking about, we're going through Armageddon. Now, chill out, because if you live by the principles of Christ, which is to just love goodness with all of your heart, the one true God, which is to be good and love thy neighbour as thyself, how you would like to be treated, you'll be fine. You might find it's hard otherwise, but just hold on. Hold on for one more day, man. <coughs> one day at a time. Hold on. And don't forget, Jesus was a revolutionary. He really did overthrow yes. everything in yes. his age. You know they spell Israel wrong. It should be spelled I-S-R-E-A-L. They've put Ra in the middle of it, which is sun worship. We're talking sun worship here. <laughs> okay. No. Put the extra O back in the God. So this is from Illuminated by the Light of Dreams, latest album from the Transpersonals. Thanks, Tim Herford. This is Hold On. Uh.
That was Hold On by the Transpersonals, and I was talking to lead singer Tim Herford. The album just out is called Illuminated by the Light of Dreams. You're listening to dialectradio.co.uk, your local community radio run by volunteers. Log on to our website at dialectradio.co.uk to find out more. Andrew Tweedy. Uh, I'm an inventor. Uh, I've been a, f- a photographer. Uh, I've recently come out, if you like, as an inventor, uh, having been funded to go on a, a de- solo desalination project in the Marshall Islands, uh, where rising sea levels are affecting water, whether it's r- rainwater that's stored in wells, which is now contaminated due to rising sea levels. So what, um, what have you invented, Andrew? A, a low, low-tech system of uh, solar desalination basically using uh, the principle of uh, the sun evaporating water as it does to produce rainfall but doing this within uh, polythene structures okay well without giving away too many patent well, secrets how, how does this work it's not patented it's going to be open sourced it is open to sourced and uh, it's been uh, replicated one of the six systems i developed are being replicated on the Marshall Islands and where I'm hoping that um, progress is made on the other uh, other four me- similar methods what well, land-based uh, floating systems suspended systems but basically imagine a, a polytunnel where you put seawater on the floor a lot of people don't realize you cannot filter seawater you either have to use reverse osmosis or e- evaporate it with heat and c- condense it with cool cold uh, and the way i do it or anyone can do it is to um imagine imagine so it's the easiest way to to understand is if you had a polytunnel you know greenhouse that on the floor instead of being plants and uh, uh you had black plastic which had shallow water on the on the floor uh, the sun heats the polytunnel and the water vapor, which is distilled water, condenses on the inside of the polytunnel. So the technique is to get that water out of the polytunnel. And we found a, a system which uh, does that by, instead of making a polytunnel, we make a polythene tube of given any diameter and, and any length, depending on how much water you want to evaporate and condense. And halfway up the the tube, uh, horizontally, if you imagine a tube, tube um, lying on the ground, instead of lying flat on the ground, it's tilted. Uh, so it's a portable device, a bit like a stretcher uh, with a series of hoops. And um, the seawater is placed in black bags suspended halfway across the diameter of the uh, tube. Uh, the, the sun heats the water, as it does, <laughs> over the sea, and the vapour rises up. But when it's in the open air, it rises up and forms clouds, and sometimes those clouds get cold enough to produce rain. Uh, but in the Marshall Islands, the trade winds and climate change has affected the way that it rains. Instead of a front of rain being carried by the trade winds, you have now got sporadic uh, cloud bursts, so to speak, that um, sometimes don't la- land on an island for a number of years. So you have, um, oh. halfway down the polytunnel, you have a kind of tube collecting the the condensed water from the polytunnel, no. and then you're running that into as a drinking water supply. Uh, it's so much easier to show an image, uh, which is why I could screen share and show you in, 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 a, in a few seconds. But uh, imagine that I have a sausage that there's a series of hoops that do the tube system. We have hanging baskets that could also do that, whereby uh, suspended from a, a, a line, you have a, a circular uh, hula hoop, imagine, which has netting over it, which is suspended from a washing line, Let's just so you get the, an idea of what things look like, whereby the hula hoop that is horizontal has a tube of polythene tightened into a knot at the top from the washing line. The, the hula hoop contains black plastic with seawater. The seawater rises, condenses on the sides 
of, on the inside of the uh, structure and then dribbles down past the hula hoop to uh, a, a knot causing it to be two, two Vs, uh, 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 a vertical V and an inverted V. So in other words, you're a bit like an egg timer, except it's the reverse. <laughs> I mean, it, it, you've got to see the picture to understand it. Anything else you've invented? Six methods of doing the same thing. One that's on the ground, one that's suspended, and one that has a great potential that floats on the sea so that you don't have to need land. And the sun and the wind power the whole system. And it's very simple technology. We call it keep it simple and, and solar desalination systems, KISS systems. Okay. The, well, what they, about, on the, I mean, for example, on the land, you, you know, you, I can imagine a polytunnel or something a mile long. Yes, indeed. <laughs> uh, but it's even cheaper to, to have it floating on the sea. In fact, imagine two sausages. This is easier to describe. You have two floating sausages whereby one end of the primary sausage is anchored to a mast. Between the two sausages where they get narrow is a, is a donut to constrict the diameter between the two inflated sausages right they're constantly inflated by the action of the wind driving an air pump uh there's a uh, by uh, which is a form of bellows as the wind tugs on the two sausages it 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 tugs an a, an elastic operated bellows which pumps air through the whole system so that the vapor evaporating in the evaporating sausage which has seawater on inside it on the floor uh, the vapor rises and is pushed through the air through the donut into the second sausage and because there's a pressure release valve at the tail of the second sausage which is the condensing sausage the hot vapor is condensed by being in contact with the relatively cold seawater and is sprayed with seawater to keep it cool also by a, a pneumatic pump and everything is uh uh, can be deployed behind a ship to provide desalinated water without any fossil fuel costs or high technology. Well, that, that's until and, a trawler comes along and crashes sure. into it. But, um, when you're uh, in the middle of the Pacific and there aren't any trawlers, uh, in, in a lagoon or wherever it is, where you've got a drought, this is a, a, a system that could um, supply... 300 or so people, which uh, is roughly the population of an atoll. Yeah, so in a, in a day, uh, I guess, <coughs> yes. ha ha I'm just wondering what, what I was going to ask, what sort of scale of population could one of these support? Well, it's all down to the, the, the surface area of the evaporating section. Yeah, of but I mean, uh, I mean, what's the biggest one, uh, you, one you've worked on? No, we, 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 we did a trial for something that was... Uh, 50 meters long uh, with a 25 meter evaporating area, 25 square meter evaporating area, uh, you we should, and we didn't uh, complete that one because this is still under development, but basically anywhere, any, if you have a square meter of evaporative area, black polythene in other words, in a greenhouse, one square meter on average will produce one and a half litres of condensed or distilled water per per 24 hours. Um, uh, so you've, you've got, you know, 12 hours of sunshine, but in fact there's only about six hours, which is when it's powerful enough. But, uh, uh, you know, it's sufficient for someone to survive. Uh, uh, it's just a very simple low-tech system. We also have one where you, used, you can use uh, recycled plastic bottles, clear... PET, P-E-T, plastic bottles used for drinking water usually, uh, where they are screwed together, having made a hole into each bottle, hung from a <laughs> hung from a wall, ten green bottles hanging from a wall <laughs> or a, a, a tree in the sun, whereby, although the bottles don't need to be in the sun, but the evaporating black polythene bag would, depending on its size, would... Uh, heat the salt water, the vapour rises up the series of interconnected uh, plastic bottles and that in turn condense the vapour back into 
uh, uh, distilled water that runs back down towards the black bag, but is is collected before it enters the black bag. So how uh, much how much uh, water do people need a day? I suppose most of us just well, take it for granted, don't we? You you you, you know, <laughs> depending on the climate. Uh, you you need uh, a gallon a day or five liters uh, five liters a day. Uh, uh, if it's very hot, you need more. Uh, so it, it's all down to. So you need four square meters of black polythene. Yes. Roughly. Yes. Uh, and you can have multiple desi- devices or one large device, and, and I, I've I've shown the uh, an option depending on your circumstances whether in an emergency when a bottle of water is <laughs> air drops, <laughs> you can then turn those empty bottles back into a system for distilling dirty water. Okay, but what what about these people that so-called survive for weeks uh, in the open ocean, say they've, they're in a lifeboat, they've been well, shipwrecked or whatever, with you, no you, water at all? No, no, you, you can't, well, you, you've got seawater, of course. The the way that there well, are... Well, no, I mean, you can't drink the seawater, can you? There are inflate existing inflatable um, in existing inflatable emergency uh solar desalinations yeah but uh, what my point is without the uh, without any form of water people have survived haven't they um you know well, in no, the in no. the in the sun etc amazing miracle survival but sometimes for weeks with no water well you you can normally only live for 3 days without water and uh uh so so um we my my project was uh, chosen in the marshall islands because uh rising sea levels are are you know so you've got the sea around you and it, it basically with about 10 pounds worth of polythene you you can survive uh, and and you can use the polythene or the black the clear polythene and the black polythene, all the recycled plastic bottles, to purify, distill. Uh, and a lot of people don't understand that you cannot filter seawater. You, you can use re- reverse osmosis, which takes a lot of pumping pressure and back flushing and a whole series of industrial. You, you need you need high energy input, but but the simplest system is basically uh, uh, using glass to um, condense the water again. So, I mean, basically, when you breathe your breath against a sheet of cold glass, you are distilling your breath into, into liquid. And uh, But glass is not something exactly portable that you can carry in a boat or, or drop from the air. Oh, so British engineering <laughs> is changing lives in the Pacific still. Uh, so, I mean, it does sound... Uh, almost too good to be true, Andrew, that we've still got some people, inventors like yourself, designing stuff which is changing lives around the planet. Well, I, I'm frustrated by the fact when I look at most, when I've looked, if you Google or, or, or check out solar distillation or solar desalination, most systems rely on glass and pumps. And my system just uses the fact that hot air rises and condenses when it meets a colder, colder surface. Look, I know you've got another interest, which is that of uh, organophosphate pestis- well, pesticides. <laughs> uh, what, what, was, what first got you interested in, in, in organophosphates? These were chemicals which were developed, I think, originally by the Nazis um, as a kind of nerve agent. But then it was found at, during the war and after the war that they were quite good at killing pests. So they were introduced in, as pesticides. Uh, you know, well, what, 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 first, of all, first of all, they, what is the original... Uh, origin of uh, organophosphate. Well, as you say, the, 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 it was a development, the, the first use of OPs, as we, for short, organophosphates, was for um, a mustard gas, which was uh, in the First World War, which uh, gassed many people. Uh, and uh, then they had all the, they had found the technique that this would kill people, but obviously could kill pests. So, and the way they work, and uh, I'm afraid, e- even recently in uh, Salisbury, I-, I am alleging uh, the the, uh, the uh, poisonous uh, toxins that we use are a, a form of organophosphate. Uh, but basically, the way they work is not. Is, you think you have a pesticide to kill flies or whatever it is? How does it kill them? 
what they do, they act on the central nervous system, disrupt the chlorinest, the message handling of the nervous system, which is called the chlorinesterase. I'm not, I'm not a scientist or a chemist, but uh, 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 so they disrupt that so that the animal loses control over its nerve functions, i.e. the jaw, and therefore it can't chew or swallow to, 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 to survive. And uh, it, uh, uh, I read a, a long article in the Guardian supplement when it was it must have been before 2001, uh, and um, I can't remember the date, but uh, initially I read a long article about the, the organic dairy farmer, Mark Purdy, who had been... Um, uh, told not to spray his organic dairy herd with Fosnet, which is a warble fly chemical uh, treatment, a treatment to kill warble flies, which are bugs that make holes in leather in the hide of a cow. And the Ministry of Agriculture uh, uh, imposed this uh, this directive, mandatory directive, thereby all cows had to be treated with this poison. And Mr. Purdy said, uh, Oi, I'm, I'm an organic farmer. I don't want to. Aha, you are you are ordered to. So he refused and therefore had to go to court to explain why he did not want to poison his animals. And this happened to be at the same time as BSE. Uh, where thousands or millions, actually, of cows were destroyed because of the infection by uh, bovine spongiform, I can't remember the right word to, to use. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, this is a few years ago where uh, um, the whole dairy industry was uh, uh, traumatised. Uh, and... Um, the go and then so his evidence and if you look at the video uh what causes bsc cjd and ms or by the organic farmer mark purdy on o about ops he um he uh gathered evidence from his vet and uh who treated one of the calves that he bought at an auction whereby it was not an organic uh, calf and it, it developed the signs of BSC, which is where the animal trembles and reacts when you clap your hands, uh, the animal staggers because its nervous system is reacting strangely to a sudden noise. And therefore, uh, he, he called his vet to analyze the, these calves uh, that and um, he had by then had re had investigated at his own uh, his own research and found that BSC was not occurring in Ireland but it was in Northern Ireland why was there a difference between the two countries the same grass you know <laughs> uh, the difference was that the directive by Minister of Agriculture Fisheries and Food was uh, applied to Northern Ireland but not to Erie so uh, that gave him the impetus to uh, dig further and the blame for the BSE outbreak was based on contaminated feed because they were feeding protein derived with meat from dead animals to feed to herbivores to cows and that was that was the 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 alleged reason for for the outbreak but he then went to court to prove from from his evidence that the outbreak was caused by the fosnet the the chemical treatment he he was imposed to to use this this organic of, phosphate yes and he um, you know something else he pointed out was that this uh this animal feed um the bits of old cows which were being fed to the animals was also cow. being fed to um the oh, saudi arabian cows yes. who didn't have any grass to eat there wasn't any grass to eat um 
and they were being fed only this stuff, but they weren't getting BSE. So I think there's a pretty conclusive proof yes. that, that this ICI chemical phosmet, this organophosphate, was behind BSE, in fact, as a kind of nerve agent, nerve gas or whatever, nerve agent, certainly, sure. which uh, poisons the animal. And, and, and obviously that meat from that animal is going to be itself... Uh, poisonous in what, what, some way to eat so it could affect anybody that eats it anyway look uh, I've also heard, seen some evidence and I wonder if you can tell us that, that this may actually be one of the reasons why we're getting things like multiple sclerosis in humans exactly uh, basically uh, uh, when you when you watch his his uh, interview uh, as I say fortunately available on YouTube uh, he is clearly expl explaining the ramifications and he, he really uh, as uh, as uh uh, to the, 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 has he says in his book Animal Farm P H A R M not F A R M Animal Farm P H A R M by Mark Purdy P U R D E Y Flycover says uh, if Purdy is right he deserves a Nobel prize for medicine and that's John Moynboyd and John Pilger the, the Australian journalist next to weapons of mass destruction BSC or mad cow disease was the Blair government's biggest scare Mark Purdy's investigation is urgent required reading and this is how many years ago okay but what uh, about this link to MS and are there any other human well, conditions see, that this could be linked to I'm, I'm unfortunately I'm I, I, I'm uh, speaking to you from having only watched this uh, YouTube for the first time in full uh, last night, but basically he is saying that interrupting not not only organophosphates, which are used as knit shampoo, for goodness sake, on children's heads, which is then withdrawn, fortunately. Uh, it's used as fly killers. It's used as a treatment for seed dressing. It's used as seed dressing or wheat dressing to avoid it going um, mouldy. You know, OPs are used also in the hydraulic oil of aircraft to avoid the hydraulic oil uh, growing mold, I suppose, or causing it to 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 uh, be um, have sort of uh, uh, growths within it. But the uh, the alleged vapor from that en engine oil has leaked into cabins, and therefore allegedly has caused uh, uh, even the pilots, the pilots especially, because they they are subjected to more of these fumes. Uh, oh, hang to, on, hang uh, on. What about the cabin staff, the stewardesses and people like that? Well, I mean, they, they presumably... Uh, so they get, um, maybe they should go around wearing masks, or gas masks. Or well, something. I... I <laughs> um, uh, it depends on the type of aircraft, but um, apparently the Queen's flight uh, was the type of aircraft that had more of these uh, uh, incidents than um, your average jet, which is, uh, you know, it happens at takeoff and, uh, uh, and and when you rev the engines, basically. But uh, in any case, you, you, what is so critical is the the effect of toxins on the cent on our central nervous system has many ramifications because it's not just the the action on the central nervous system it's the interruption of our immune system and when our immune system is affected then our own defense is sabotaged now andrew i'm sure some listeners are thinking surely the government would never allow this to happen well he was taken to court uh, his evidence was mocked. Uh, his uh, his uh, telephones were um, sabotaged. His uh, dairy milk quota was um, was uh, um, uh, cancelled. Uh, he subjected many forms of uh, of um, mockery to to try and uh, to try and. Um, uh, undermine his his research and he in fact he had many many uh people sponsored him to carry out this research because uh, uh it, it ops are also used in sheep dip and you may well have heard of farmers reacting to sheep dip which has now been the formulation has been changed to to um, reduce the risk from ops uh, but we, we, what the, the formulation has been changed to, uh, who knows what that can cause. But basically, when you try and poison something, <laughs> you also poison everything, 
whether it's the soil, the the plants, the the animal meat, uh, it goes down the whole food chain. And really, it is an insidious to use systemic pesticides because it, as I say, it doesn't go away. Now, in the same way, Andrew, in the same way DDT, in the same way DDT, DDT uh, was found to be a poison <laughs> uh, and, and had b bad side effects, this, I believe, that, as Mark Purley does, that, that uh, OPs and a whole family of other uh, pesticides or chemicals, you know, the fumes from welding, there's a whole ramp of it. Okay, and so we've heard about uh, we've so heard about so Mark's book, Animal yes. Farm, Animal, P-H-A-R-M. Is there any other way that people can find out more about OPs? I really think that uh, because the vested interests of the pesticide industry especially are uh, d don't want this to get out because... Um, we, we use poisons in our gardens. You know, we, the, the farmers spray fields ne next door to us. I mean, I'm struggling to wonder uh, why would the government allow any of these enormous poisons to get out into the population? Ah, the, the, the reason is, the reason is the government licenses those pesticides. They give them a permit to be used. They are considered safe by the government. And therefore, the pesticide industry... If there's a, a, a problem, then the pesticide say your government licensed us to do this. So we're complying with regulations. But, but right? the government shouldn't be doing that if these things are poisonous. No, they shouldn't. So why do they? Why do governments listen to certain people more than the others? I would say follow the money. Andrew Tweedy, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you. You're listening to dialectradio.co.uk, your local community radio run by volunteers. Log on to our website at dialectradio.co.uk to find out more. My name is uh, Peter Oak. I uh, first met Sabine McNeil in the House of Commons in the Great Hall in 2007. And at that time, she was running um, a computer program uh, on the Internet, of, of which I am computer illiterate. I will have nothing whatsoever to do with Facebook, LinkedIn or any of that. But I was contacted, would I go to the House of Commons concerning uh, financial frauds? Uh, concerning, it was concerning the Bradbury Pound and a barter system whereby uh, people did work or favours uh, as a means of paying bills instead of using cash. Uh, as I say, I met Sabine and after having a, a few chats and various MPs, we ended up talking and I mentioned things about child kidnapping, child trafficking, which was all new to Sabine. She thought... Uh, I, I was slightly nuts. Uh, but it then went from there. She found out that uh, what I was telling her was the truth. And it, it just seemed to gel with her in that it's taken me more or less years to find out that she appears to be a very uh, religious woman. Uh, she believes in uh, God, in good, and that what I was talking about was she didn't want to believe. And uh, she'd seen enough suffering through a mother with the Nazis in Germany. She was born in Germany. She was in Dresden as a child. Uh, they were burnt out after it was severely bombed by the RAF. And uh, that she was a computer programmer uh, and a mathematician for CERN the Euroatom project in Geneva. So why is Sabine in jail? Because the police are persecuting her and the paedophile. These paedophiles are in positions of authority in local government, in social services, in the judiciary, in the courts, in the police, and they're trying to conceal it. But the journalists, Peter, realize... Peter, the journalist, will say that the arguments put forward in court just haven't stood up. 
Well, how can they stand up when no one is allowed to give any evidence? And a judge ridicules them. They will not allow a case to go ahead. They're gagged. How come you know better than the court does? Because I've been around a bit. I've been a victim of police corruption. And the biggest one was Gordon Anglesey, Superintendent Anglesey, North Wales Police, who for 25 years was abusing boys in Bryn Estyn Home near Wrexham, and the Freemasons protected him. And eventually he was convicted last November, and he died in prison two weeks later. That is not me making up stories. That is absolute fact. But Gordon that, Anglesey. The most recent uh, on this particular case in Hampstead, the Hammond Hires reported that uh, the Hampstead satanic sex abuse uh, case has been discredited. That's what the Hammond Eyes said. Who's investigated it? Well, there has been some investigation of the Hampstead case, but well, the police where have decided. Why aren't they in the dock? The police have decided that there's there's nothing to see. Obviously, of otherwise they, they would have the prosecuted people. The police are involved in it. This is the whole point. Of okay, it. what evidence do you have for that in this specific case? You then? won't have evidence. You can't possibly get evidence. They control it. If they choose not to investigate a crime, then what can I do or anybody else? And all the journalists get warned off. OK, children, but Sabine has been accused of some pretty serious things, hasn't she? She's been accused of uploading uh, details about parishioners onto the internet and the judge is saying that she's beginning to now intimidate witnesses, harass witnesses. I mean, the British Human Rights Act 2000, we do not have Article 1. It starts at Article 2, the right to life. Article 1 says the following articles are binding on the high-standing parties. So, in other words, Britain didn't sign up to the European Convention of Human Rights. So that's one article missing. Secondly, Article 13 is missing. And Article 13 says the right to a remedy. And we have no remedy. We are secretly enslaved by a judicial Masonic mafia. And the police, when I say the police are corrupt, I don't mean the constables. I am talking of chief constables. Can you see it from the point of view of people who would say, well, actually, Sabina's been hounding us and we've been found innocent by the courts? I'm not passing any views on the people involved. I am saying Sabine McNeil has only been putting out there to protect children and what she's been informed of. What's exactly she in for? Breaching her bail. Well, she shouldn't have even... Be, she was charged with harassment. Yes? Of these, these witnesses you were so-called referring to, Sabine was charged with harassing them under the Harassment Act 97. But unfortunately, uh, Section 3 of the Harassment Act states that anybody who is for the purpose of preventing or detecting crime does not apply. That is the absolute defence to any charge of harassment. But the implication is that there was no crime. Sabine is saying that child abuse is going on, satanical ritual abuse, sexual practices, God knows what deviance, and the police have charged her with harassment. Now, why haven't they investigated her allegations? Well, that's all for this week. Dialects Bristol's first weekly MP3 podcast. You can download it to listen on your phone or in the car. You can subscribe and listen the week before broadcast if you want at dialectradio one word, dot co, dot uk. Thanks to our guests, Tim Herford from the Transpersonals. Another plug for their album, it's just out, it's called Illuminated by the Light of Dreams. Also Andrew Tweedy talking about desalination on organophosphates. And finally you just heard there Peter Oates talking about the Hampstead case and the imprisonment of one of our regular correspondents on this show, Sabine McNeil. Thanks also to studio engineer Dave Bazanko. Dialects of Bristol Broadband Co-op Production. Catch us on Bristol Community FM 93.2 every Tuesday at noon. And anyone can contribute. 
Contact us through the People's Republic of Stokescroft, just off Jamaica Street on 0117 909 6897. They're online at prsc.org.uk. You can volunteer with us or for hundreds of opportunities elsewhere in Britain via the national volunteering website do-it.org. That was Dialect, and I'm Tony Gosling, wishing you a very good week. Thanks for listening. Till the same time next week, goodbye for now. Thank you.